Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome here to our Mars webinar. Tonight in Germany, it's nine o'clock in the evening and it's 12 p.m. At, uh, in Seattle, United States. Um, and we have today a wonderful topic. It's about innovative and price contracting here in Germany uh, in the German AMNOC process. Our, as the subtitle is, is just, is this the future or just a dream? Next slide, Roman, please. <clears throat> exactly. Today's speakers are uh, Stefan Walzer, who is here as the CEO of Mars, of the Market Access and Pricing Strategy. And also we have tonight, our, as a special guest, our colleague Roman Spelsberg. He is also working at Mars. Hello, Roman. Hello, Stefan. Hi. But before Good we start, we, we want to uh, shortly introduce Mars. Uh, Mars, we are your specialist in reimbursement, pricing, and health economics in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. So if you need any help with uh, pricing and reimbursement strategies, health economics, negotiation support, especially with our virtual reality bootcamp, or a submission for reimbursement, for example, for the GBA, for the DGAS now here in Germany, the digital, digital health applications um, for the Swiss BAG or the Austrian Hauptverband, uh, please feel free to contact us and we help you. you. Please check out our website www.marketaccess-pricingstrategy.de. And of course, just before we start, here are some uh, rules. Uh, your questions are uh, very welcome. So feel free to ask questions. After the presentation, we will have plenty of time to answer your questions. Um, you can use that either the Zoom chat function or the question and answer function. Both will work to raise your comments or questions. And of course, one question is always rise. Do, we, do you publish uh, the slides? Yes, they will be provided to you afterwards and also the video of this, the recording will be published on our website. And here also check out our latest uh, webinars. So for example, the one with the EU HD is it to come? That was from August or also the one with when is the second wave coming? And I feel Stefan is not Nostradamus, <laughs> right? He really, now we are just before here in Germany, you had it in the news just before the lockdown. So, um, and you know, you could predict it because there are very good statistical and analytical tools. Um, so far, it was not a miracle. Okay, uh, sorry about that, Stefan. So, okay, uh, you're not the, the miracle. Okay, uh, so, so check out on our website here uh, the webinars um, with the plenty ones you have here. Um, also about the healthcare cost of COVID, for example. Good. Um, then we start tonight with uh, innovative outcomes based risk sharing contracts as a solution within the German AMNOC process. Let me welcome you again, uh, Roman Svalsberg, our colleague from Mars, and also the CEO of Mars, Dr. Stefan Walzer. And I think, Stefan, the floor is now yours. Perfect. Thank you very much again, Lutz, as always, every last Thursday. Good introduction, and I'm looking forward also to the coming minutes. I think also to you, Roman. So let's just uh, start with that. I think uh, next slide. I think um, before we go into the details of the whole kind of, um, let's say, German specifics, I think a core cool question is obviously always, why do we really want to go even the pathway we have just put into the question, right? So why do health systems or why do payers really want to share risk or do we want to really share risk? I think one of the ideas or let's say one of the components, the rationales of why risk sharing agreement was probably as well born to is exactly basically what you see on the right hand side with the different kind of figures on there. What you see there is basically the different kind of drug prices, the discounted drug prices in try to correlation to a different in terms of overall survival, which is figure A, progression free survival, figure B, or also the objective response rate, which is figure C. Um, 
even without knowing the specifics, let's say, on oncology, I think it's also evident that there is, at least on those, let's say, figures, on those kind of graphs, no clear correlation between the difference in terms of efficacy and the difference in terms of drug prices, which I think ultimately, and also from a theoretical perspective, it should be. So why, let's say, let's put it that way, the diff, there might be different kind of reasons why that has happened. It has also different kind of drivers around the price. It's also quite clear, but it's also very, very clear and evident that there might be potentially some kind of mismatches. And hence, sometimes it is also why for different stakeholders to share um, the risks. Uh, next slide, please. So ultimately, I think, especially if we now move a bit further, right, especially into the future, um, those kind of, let's say, risk share agreements might be kind of, a, let's call it a different kind of tool in order to have and potentially guarantee a kind of success story. So it's more kind of disruptive innovation, disruptive success story, right? So it might not be the kind of standard pathway if you have something very new, something very innovative, and I think that's also one of the reasons I think, Roman, you will as well have one of the examples as well later on um, in your presentation. Next slide, please. So overall, I mean, we have just seen that there might be good reasons why a risk share agreement maybe, or why just sharing um, as well risks. Um, but I think it's also a bit broader than what I have just uh, shown there, right? I mean, sometimes a lot of times, and especially maybe for those kind of innovative therapies, Maybe also think about, let's say, oral uh, often drug therapies um, with not a lot of, let's say, evidence base, where I think the evidence base might potentially, even in some of those cases, only based on one arm, uh, one -arm studies. That, you know, just take that as given, right? It's not just the only. Sometimes it's, it's not otherwise really possible to run those kind of studies. But I think it's also, especially with those kind of studies, maybe the kind of efficacy, the delta of the efficacy, so the added benefit might not be clear, at least not in the initial kind of uh, launch year or years. So that is as well maybe the kind of bit of the uncertainty in terms of outcomes. I think what is also quite clear is the kind of uncertainty on safety. I think that's not really something new. That's even the kind of case with, let's say, um, therapies with a quite good evidence base. A lot of times they have randomized clinical trials as a basis but a lot of times it's based not the kind of long-term run of, on, on the safety. And also, it's also quite clear that not, it's not only the long-term run, but it's also the kind of overall patient population which might have another potential safety profile than the um, population within the clinical trial. Finally, there could also be other kind of challenges like clearly budget impact. Think about the kind of new gene therapies as an example with the uh, quite proportionally high costs but also on the other side, it's not only the cost, it is also potentially the kind of low number of patients. That's also a bit the kind of question, right? I mean, especially maybe if the target population is quite clear, but if the payer side might be maybe not, uh, let's say, um, agreeing on that. So the kind of potential, the uncertainty on those patient numbers might be potentially seen as being bigger. So that might also be a challenge. And hence, it's maybe a question what to do with that um, not touching base now on the service delivery. Next slide, please. So overall, um, there are different kind of opportunities and possibilities for those. Now we call it just managed um, managed entry agreement. You could also call it risk share agreement or also the other kind of words which are being used um, in the last couple of years. So if you just start with, on, on that kind of figure on the top end, yes, uh, there could be what I have just laid out in the last couple of minutes, the uncertainty around efficacy, long-term efficacy, or also the safety. And on the other hand, it could also be the kind of uh, uncertainty around the financial part. So it's a lot of the times, basically, the kind of budgetary limitation or just generally the budget impact. So bringing both together could potentially then lead as well into a so-called managed end agreement. And also here we have then again the kind of split, right? which could be kind of non-outcome space, which is then more financial-based risk share agreement, or on the other hand, an outcomes-based agreement. I think are, those are basically the, the, the two different types, and I think it's also quite clear, I think when we're speaking now in the next couple of minutes, it's more on that kind of right-hand side, right hand side, yeah, right-hand side in red now, um, when we speak about the outcomes-based agreement. Even though 
we can now further differentiate on the population level and the patient level. I think also both types are possible. I think if we speak, for example, about the patient level, and you see on that side as well, that kind of brownish kind of box with the coverage with evidence development. Keep in mind that could also well be one of the new kind of, uh, let's say, steps as well within the AMNOG process. So that's as well the first time I think for tonight that we touch base a bit on the AMNOG and Oman will as well take that again further in the, in, in, in a couple of um, minutes. Um, this is especially a kind of new pathway in a way, which was clearly, let's say, more defined in the last couple of months. And since especially also early this year when the GBA has further been defined and also clearly uh, the Ministry of Health in Germany, with uh, which kind of, let's say, next steps in terms of evidence development might potentially be applicable, especially for orphan drugs where and there might not be a sufficient evidence base. Okay, next slide, please. Um, before we now, let's say, jump into the German specifics and, you know, how this could look like and also a bit on, on the examples, I think what you might potentially as well uh, know right away, I think that uh, there are a lot of examples of managed um, entry treatment in the EU5 since years. I mean, Italy, I think, has been on the forefront since many, many years. I think it's probably already now roughly 20 years, I think, since they do such kind of pay for performances. I think there are different kind of, let's say, options they apply. But also, for example, Spain, I think, especially on a national level. But I personally have as well been involved, for example, on various of those agreements on a regional level. And not to forget, obviously, uh, the UK, I think there there were as well very interesting ones, and I think also publicly a lot debated kind of outcomes, a risk share agreement um, um, roughly 10, 12 years ago in the UK and France, if you take, for example, the price volume agreements, we just had that as well on the last slide. This is, I think, it clearly a kind of standard as well agreement in France. But there, there are a lot of more kind of examples. I think also, I think, Omar, you had a solid, very, very deep look into those kind of examples to also see what is then possible and potentially also applicable into the German process. So that was the kind of introduction. So I'm now also happy to, let's say, hand over to uh, Roman Spersberg. I mean, he's uh, as well working within our team here and um, had a lot of experience as well, uh, not only within Mars, but uh, also with uh, different other pharmaceutical companies. And you spend as well quite a bit of time also with that topic in one of the largest health insurance companies. Um, uh, in the last uh, couple of months before you joined as well, Mark. So looking forward to your slides, to your words, Roman, and uh, looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan, for the good introduction. Um, I'm happy you hand over now and a warm welcome from my side to all the home offices or living rooms or wherever you watch that webinar today. Um, as Stefan already mentioned, I had a quite extensive look into managed entry agreements. Um, we call it today innovative pricing agreements, but I rather prefer alternative pricing agreements because as Stefan already mentioned, those agreements are not new in the world. They're just new in the German context in a way. So um, if we talk about this alternative pricing agreements, also called managed entry agreements, um, we have I did research from a pharmaceutical point of view, as well as from the insurance point of view, and also from the research point of view, and want to summarize the main findings now in a few slides. And the first question was, uh, when should those um, contracts take place? And that's a clear answer from all sides. We should have those contracts in place at the first day of market access, especially if we're looking now into HMPs, where those, um, where those contracts are um, made for at the moment um, they have already patients lined up for because of screenings for example and um, there will be a lot of patients especially in the first month and we see a lot of um, budget impact happening in the first month of market access therefore we need uh, those pricing agreements already from the start from the launch date on and we have the um, legislative uh, regulation framework in place in germany we are quite strict, as everybody knows, with our data laws. But in this case, uh, we have um, the regulatory framework, which allows us to track and measure outcomes and link those to the payments. So that is not a problem on this end. And um, those uh, contracts are from both sides, from the insurance side, as well as from the, um, from the pharmaceutical company side, are um, kind of response to the public pressures. 
Because if we're looking at ATMPs, for example, the CAR T cell therapies, which have the potential to be curative therapies, um, those are very promising innovations, and we really want to get, get uh, grant um, market access to these potential innovations, and therefore need the agreements to overcome uncertainties, as uh, um, Stefan pointed out, as well as financial issues. And the marketing authorization holders, so the pharmaceutical companies, also um, want to strengthen their market entry with those agreements as a tool. And now coming to the, the main question of our webinar today is um, where should this um, contract take place in the Amnox system? The question is not really where, the question is when. Because I already mentioned that uh, we should have those contracts on the first day of market access. That means um, you might be familiar with the Amnox process. The first day of market access starts then the first year of free pricing. And during this first year, we already need the managed entry agreements or alternative pricing agreements um, to, um, to kind of cover already the budget impact which is occurring. So the, the time point is really first day of market access, those agreements are already in place. That's at least what we see for the uh, current agreements negotiated. And um, the, the thing is, um, it is, it is quite difficult to have those agreement uh, between insurances and pharmaceutical companies. The, the issue is not about the goal because all stakeholders in the health system have the same goal. They want to provide the best possible care for patients, obviously. But the intermediate goals are divergent. So um, it is really about having an iceberg in mind. The, the managed entry agreement itself is not rocket science. It's quite simple, it's quite straightforward. You have outcomes, you measure them, you link those to the, um, to the payment. Um, what is difficult is the underlying issues within those agreements and those are occurring at the price negotiations. So um, we just highlight four now in this slide. Um, the one is, um, and that's even the, quite the hardest one, how to measure treatment success. And here comes the question in mind for all stakeholders at the table, at the negotiation table, what happens if the disease progresses? So we're really not tracking the kind of the positive effects of the treatment, we're tracking what would happen if the, um, if the treatment doesn't work, if there's no response or if there's a progression in the, uh, in, the, um, in the disease, because that's easier to measure and that's easier to link to outcomes. And then there's a, a whole discussion about rebates, obviously, in every pricing agreement, <laughs> that's, that's a hard burning issue. Um, but here there's a different perspective on it because we have the basic rebates, which um, insurances always want because they have some um, workload just for agreeing on those um, agreements in the first place and also measuring them, the outcomes, and then um, having all the financial um, accounting in the background. So, um, the basic rebates is on the one hand, as well as the um, performance-based um, rebate then. So the um, pay for performance rebate, if you want to call it like this. Another question is the time frame. Um, this appears to be a hard issue because um, insurances um, kind of make from a health economic point of view, they want to have kind of return of investment analysis, uh, potentially, which means a standard of care for the next 10 years costs this amount, you say you cure the, um, you cure the patient, therefore you don't have the costs anymore um, for the next 10 years, okay, then we should do the agreement also for 10 years, the pay for performance agreement, obviously. But that, that, is, that is difficult because we have uh, accruals we, ha we have to do and uh, therefore um, we have to find a middle pathway here um, because for 10 years that would be just too long. But that are just um, um, numbers, um, not actual numbers, just example numbers. And um, a burning issue is also the role of um, those agreements within the central price negotiation because we learned today already, that um, they should take place from the first day of market exxon. So the, the pharmaceutical company is giving a rebate in a freely pricing period on the, of the first 12 months. And they want to have that uh, accounted in the price negotiations, obviously. But insurance companies rather see this as two separate pathways. So uh, this is quite difficult to handle in Germany. And both sides are, uh, both sides are kind of understandable. We have to just find a middle pathway here. This was on the inpatient sector. 
because uh, currently managed entry agreements are mainly done in the inpatient sector for ATMPs, um, at least what's public, public available uh, as evidence. Now we're looking at the outpatient sector. Um, there are not, um, there's nearly no evidence on agreements yet. But um, we see from the um, data flow within this health system that it might be possible because we have um, clearly data generating from hospital outpatient setting as well as from the triangle between pharmacies, patient and physicians. Um, they are all generating data on first the medical treatment data. So what is the, pay, uh, the, the physician doing? And second, the prescription data. So which medicines am I applying? And, and those are coming together in the insurances. So they are aggregating those data. They have both sides. So that, that sounds like it might be possible to do um, pay for performance, for example. Sure. Um, but I want to highlight here also the, the time frame. We're talking about nine months, up to nine months, until we have hard data aggregated. Because we have a quarterly data collection, we have a billing process, which, which takes quite a lot, a lot of time currently. Hopefully the prescription is uh, speeding that process up a bit. And then we have another four months of just data uh, validating and um, ensuring quality of data because uh, insurances don't want to pay for anything they, they, um, that is wrong. So um, the whole process until we have aggregated data can take up to nine months, which um, should be put into consideration when talking about managed entry agreements. But if we dive into those data, we definitely have the basis for those agreements. Um, for the most important things, uh, product name, patient ID, insurance um, are all on prescription data. So this is um, quite fast um, uh, available. What's more difficult if we have to have the medical treatment data aggregated to this, um, because then it's more indication based, uh, the data quality. Um, if we, for example, look into indication, it's highly depending on which therapy we are talking about. For some indications, there's one um, possible um, um, uh, medicine for that indication, and then it's straightforward. It's possible to see um, what it's given for. If we have uh, one medicine which can be applied in several indications, we might be able to do a cross match with the medical treatment data and therefore uh, see what kind of indication, indication it's given. But if that's not possible and that's not too consistent, it's difficult to do those. So um, just what I want to highlight here, what, what we should keep in mind is it's easiest to do one agreement for one medicine. It is more difficult to do one agreement for one indication because then we have to dive into deep into data and see if that's even feasible to do. And also, um, so that that would be indication-based pricing and also um, the combination-based pricing is a different part, it's, it's more difficult because um, then we need um, data on the co-medication. And if we now talk about elder, elderly with um, comorbidities, uh, receiving a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of medicines, it's difficult to tell which medicines are now given for that indication and which medicines are given for another indication. So that makes the, the whole process um, a lot more complicated. So simple pay for performance contracts are possible, but indication-based and combination-based is rather uh, a discussion um, from case to case. And now we talked about in the, uh, the inpatient sector where we have a lot of evidence already. Then we talked about the outpatient sector where we definitely have the database to do agreements. Now we want to take you on the future track again also a bit because we are super proud in Germany, obviously that we have um, the, the um, digital app on prescription, as we call it. So we have digital health applications within a strict uh, reimbursement framework. And within this reimbursement framework, there is a possibility for managed entry agreements. And there might also be an opportunity for both sides, for insurances, as well as pharmaceutical companies within um, the managed entry agreements. Let me shortly describe why. We now have four, five digital health applications. Let's, at least that was the um, the, the actual number today that might change in the, the next upcoming days, but now we have five and three of those are covered within a conditional agreement, which means they are authorized and you can prescribe those digital health applications under the condition that they are generating additional data over the next time frame. So um, this is kind of similar to coverage of evidence development agreement for pharmaceuticals. 
as we touched base on previously. So we already have those agreements within the strict framework of reimbursement. And there also might, potential, um, might be potential for other issues. If we have budget impact issues, as well as payment and measuring, measuring value. Because for example, um, if you look at budget impact, we don't know how many patients will receive those apps, how, how big is the adoption rate and so on. So um, that's, that might be an uncertainty which lowers the price. Why not um, think about a capping agreement where we say 500,000 patient max can have this um, digital health application, therefore we need an adequate price. So this might be an, uh, also an, an enabler of market access and an enabler of a good, fair price for all sides. We shortly summarized um, just the, um, the, the burning issues and what, be, what managed entry agreements could enable access um, regarding those issues. If we look at budget impact, for example, I already mentioned the capping uh, contracts, which are price volume agreements um, on utilization data on the whole system level. This is really um, already established around the globe. Um, those are not really difficult contracts and they can also be possible for digital health applications. The, um, that if we have financial con constraints, we might look into util utilization caps and rebates. So simple rebates, um, every patient gets 10% rebate, for example, and therefore um, the financial constraints are lowered. If you look at data uncertainty, which is the burning issue for ATMPs and pharmaceuticals at the, at the moment, so for the advanced therapy medicinal products, um, um, there um, we could do a coverage of evidence development. We already have that fixed in the reimbursement framework. That might be a solution to say, we give you market access, you generate data over the next year, um, and that is also fine for the companies because they have early access um, and can generate additional data and already have their uh, revenues also, obviously. And also if we talk about financial constraints combined with data uncertainty, which means we have uncertain budget impact and we have data issues on uh, value because it is quite tough sometimes as well as with pharmaceuticals, to show the value of a digital app, of a digital health application. And therefore, um, we might have linked contracts where value-based pricing is really put, the, 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 the idea of value-based pricing is, is really put to the end where we pay for value because we measure values in the real world and directly link the payment to that. As the last one, I want to um, put you a bit out of the comfort zone, a bit out of the box. Um, we um, want to discuss with you today also what if, um, what if we would try to implement a centralized system for those managed entry agreements in Germany. We have that in Italy, for example, with the IFA registry, where um, systematically the data is collected and directly linked to the, um, to the payment. Could that also be possible in Germany? We have summarized this, um, this process um, very briefly, which means we have the, the contact between, uh, with, with, between the patient and the pharmacist, um, giving the prescription, going to the pharmacy, and then from the pharmacy with the prescription data, we already have the aggregated first party data. So we, um, that is not established yet, that is just, a, a food for thought. Um, what if we have a third party um, having all the data, which is not from insurances controlled and not from the financial companies controlled, which is really a um, separate third party, um, analyzing the data and then managing the data stream as well as the financial stream. That would enable a way easier, way faster um, way of data transfer in the, um, in the outpatient sector as well. Um, and also, if we talk about e-prescription now, that would be uh, much easier um, with a third party, just having the e-prescription right away um, and then um, having the whole data. And then the, this is the data framework we're basing our uh, pay for performance contracts, for example, on. So this might be a solution in the future. Uh, there, already, there have been discussions in the past and there will be discussions in the future. Um, and we are um, keen to see what is coming in the future, if that um, will take a centralized pathway or the more decentralized pathway as we have it today. 
as a short summary or conclusion, we talked about um, why we're doing this. We have several challenges. Um, Stefan pointed out we have safety issues as well as uncertainties on the data, as well as uncertainties on the financial impact. So this makes managed entry agreements, alternative reimbursement agreements or innovative reimbursement agreements, however you want to call them. Um, this, this makes an urgent need for them. Then we, we talked about how we're going to do this. Um, we talked about a framework and then we have to have um, several discussions uh, about each individual product, for example, on treatment outcomes as well as the time frame. And we talked about what is coming in the future, what could come in the future, and how this whole system could evolve to enable, in, in the end, value-based pricing at its best. Perfect. Very good. Thank you, Roman. I think there was a good kind of, uh, uh, it, it, it kind of tried to deep dive, right? <laughs> uh, which is always difficult in 20 minutes. So. <laughs> I think uh, that was um, very good. Lutz? Thank you, Roman for and Stefan for this nice presentation. And now we are all set here and waiting for your questions to raise uh, and some are already coming in. Um, so the one question, uh, well, that is actually a well-known or uh, um, this person knows actually what's going on with the new laws in Germany. He's asking about the routine practice data collection according to paragraph 35A, 3B of the Social Code Book 5 in Germany. That's the Anwendungsbegleitende Datenerhebung. Um, even in Germany, it sounds horrible and it's actually a horrible tool. So, um, Stefan, uh, the routine practice data collection, how does it fit in there? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, uh, I think, first of all, I think it's a perfect question, I think, for the kind of uh, topic we've just discussed, right? I mean, I tried to, um, to introduce that already um, in one of the first slides I had. I mean, it, it basically fits perfectly, I think, to what I think uh, Roman has just um, summarized. I mean, at the end of the day, um, uh, the uh, I think a cool question why well let's say rational why that kind of legal let's call it frame um, has been implemented um, or has been uh, changed in Germany it was especially that um, that in uh, let's say for some orphan drugs there is not enough evidence basically available at the time of launch at least not from the perspective of the decision makers and I think what they just wanted to have is basically kind of mandate let's let's call it like that. Um, that such kind of often drugs um, could then, uh, um, well, let's say, need to as well um, develop further evidence and would then need to further re and resubmit clearly the kind of evidence later on. I think um, also quite clearly, I think this is just in the first step with the GBA. So it's a bit in contradiction at the end of the day, what Roman as well said, we should have a contract, let's say, before we even go into the AMNOC system. So we can maybe as well touch base on that in a couple of minutes as well. And Roman, maybe you have a lot of thoughts on that. I mean, how this could maybe work together because ultimately the price negotiation is happening after the GBA decision, right? So if we would not have, a, let's say, assuming an agreement before we go into the AMNOC, uh, let's say, process, you have the GBA with the decision, um, with the mandate that the company would need to generate further evidence and the, at the same time you could obviously take that as an opportunity let's say into the price negotiation but this is not with an individual health insurance company this is then with the head association of the health insurance company so i think this might be then a bit of the tricky part even though that i could very well imagine that you could also find let's say somehow in a kind of an attractive let's call it attractive risk share agreement not an innovative risk share agreement which could still also work for the head association i think that's, I think, where I think that system would quite nicely fit. I don't know, Roman, do, do you have any kind of thoughts on the timing issue for that? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so um, th that would be um, some kind of um, coverage of evidence development, and you would um, call it from the research point of view. So you have in conditional market access agreement from the first day of market access and then generating um, additional data on, on the um, effectiveness of the drug while it is on the market. And um, we have uh, evidence also that this is that those agreements are part of the negotiation because 
the head association of the insurance funds um, published um, an, a guideline how did you um, manage entry agreements for one truck? So um, it was at least um, partly um, publicly available um, for a short time period. So there is evidence that this is, an, it is definitely an, an issue in the pricing, uh, in the head, um, in the price negotiation between the head association and the pharmaceutical companies. Um, but there is currently not um, a an, an contract done within um, all insurances and the pharmaceutical company. It's a federal system in, uh, as we have in Germany where all insurance are doing it um, one by one. That covers it a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So um, next question is about the latest experiences we have with gene therapies, MEAs, and thoughts about the implementation of a staggered payments in Germany. Uh, perfect question. Um, if I if I could, um, because uh, Free Roman. the discussion we have uh, with uh, with gene therapies, uh, we have two separate ways of doing that. Um, I hope that that is the the the, the question here is um, doing staged payments. Uh, which means um, you have the, the product on the market and you, um, if the product works, you pay the insurance, uh, the insurance pays you this way around. And uh, this is um, measured, for example, we saw it in, 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 in France, I think, um, where you have it on the market in the time of, um, uh, of uh, initiation, you get a payment. After one year, if it works, you get a payment. After two years, you get a payment and so on. In Germany, uh, that is not the case. Um, as we mentioned in the one EU5 slide, um, in Germany we have a different kind of mechanism where um, you, you bring the uh, product on the market and um, you pay the insurance back if it doesn't work. So basically the other way around. And the main reason, um, that would really go into way too much detail, the main reason is um, how the insurances are receiving the money from the central funds. So um, they have a risk adjustment fund and uh, because of those mechanisms, it's just possible to do the one way and not the other way. But from a research point of view, that's, that's an excellent example. And also mentioned from a lot of researchers that it might be the most promising way of doing managed entry agreements. But in Germany, we see it the other way around, not with stage payments. Anything to add, Stefan, from your side? Nothing to add. I think, uh, Roman, I think uh, perfectly, I think, summarized. I think uh, that's the current situation. I think it's at least something to keep in mind. But I think the important part, I think, just maybe to, to, to just um, end that in, in a very short kind of way. But I think it, 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 it just shows that I think it's not just the idea what you need to have, right, on the potential, let's say, solution on the kind of uh, payment scheme. I think it's also clearly shown that. Um, you need to understand as well how the whole kind of system works, the financial system. And I think that was, I think, an, a perfect example, I think, where we have, especially in Germany, I think a quite complex financial system between all of the different kind of regions and all of the different kind of health insurance companies. Just keep in mind, we still have 111 uh, statutory health insurance in Germany. So I think this is also making that a bit more difficult in contrast to, let's say, an NHS kind of system like in Italy and, the, and in the UK. But um, just uh, to don't make you afraid of uh, managed entry agreements, you don't have to contract with all the 111 insurances because we have um, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, some, some insurance are bounded together to do those contracts. So if you have about five contracts in place, you covered um, more than 80% of all mm -hmm. patients. So if you really want to have that, that light tower um, as in, uh, with, with that agreement, you have five agreements and that, covers most of it. Mm. Right, absolutely, yeah, absolutely true. Yeah, Roman is referring to the AOKs and the PKKs uh, and all that. Okay, uh, coming to the next questions. Um, what are the common types of contracts and agreements we've seen for ATMPs so far? Are they considered successful? Hmm, depending on which side you see successful, right? For the for the state yeah. health insurances or for the pharmaceutical company, right? I mean, I, I would I would maybe even take a step backwards, right? I think um I think for Germany, I think the the whole kind of um uh, let's say um, 
pathway is probably still quite new, right? I think, um, and, I mean, there were a lot of discussion, I think, already years ago, um, and then I think Omar mentioned that as well when, when he was introducing the whole kind of thing. Um, but I think um, at the end of the day, we really, really had just those kind of, let's call it innovative kind of agreements now just in the last, um, let's say, two years, right? I think it was basically with the new kind of at and um, I mean, there were different kind of trials, I think um, roughly 10, 12 years ago, there were some outcomes-based risk share agreements in a hospital setting that was tried. I think, um, let's call it, it was not really understood well from the public. I think there was also from a press, I think there was, let's say, a bit of a difficult discussion. I think that was probably also stopping a bit that kind of, uh, uh, let's say, pathway for, for quite a while. I think now just with the ATMPs, it has just been, again, raised again. But I think just to come back to the successfulness, I think uh, at the end of the day, I think it's probably just too early, right? I mean, we just need to keep in mind, as, as a woman said, I mean, you, you're basically counting the individuals, right? And, and then um, at the end of the day, you need to find a way in order to define the successfulness, basically for, let's also said it, for the health insurance side, but also for the industry side. But you can only do that if you have at least a couple of patients as well, roll through that kind of process, right? I mean, if you have only one, two, or three kind of patients, we all know from a statistical perspective, it could just be randomness, right? So it could be randomness successful, but it could also be randomly unsuccessful. So I think, I think at the end of the day, I think we still need to wait a bit, I think, until we see really if it's successful. I mean, well, what are your experiences, Roman? I mean, when you had those discussions within the health insurance companies as well? Yeah, I mean, um, let, let me put it like this. Um, they, they definitely did what they were meant for. Uh, they shared the risk of the new products. And that is, um, <laughs> on, on the bottom line, that is what managed entry agreements are there for. So um, if, if a pharmaceutical company has a, a certain expectation about the value of a product because they have clinical studies and they think, oh yeah, it's, it's going to work that great, um, and they're doing managed entry agreements, and it does work that great, um, they, have, they have what they want to do. If, they, if it works less than that, they might uh, make less out of it because it's value based. If they, if it is even better than they expected, um, they make more money out of it. So it's it's definitely risk sharing. And um, for the new products, it enabled market access. Um, it, it really um, put the the public was the, the public relation was also better in this case as um, Stefan mentioned. Uh, few years ago, to over 10 years ago, um, it was a, a different perception from the public, but um, Give Cool Service Plus uh, made um, public announcements about their contracts, pay for performance contracts, and kind of um, put out the pressure um, of it um, by, by just showing that we are paying for value. And that is the important message yeah. for outside. And also it enabled the faster access, which is also nice. Um, so um, in uh, for ATMPs, we have, um, um, we we need to have agreement um, that uh, we are covering the costs uh, within the hospital, and that that process is shortened with managed entry agreements. So it has a different perspective why they really worked. So they did what they were meant for. They shared the risk. It was truly value based pricing, or is still, and uh, we need to see the effects um, now uh, to quantify uh, the real um, outcomes. Yeah, I mean, it's a very good point. I think actually just to add maybe as well, because we're uh, discussing a lot around at ps right? I think um, clearly because of the kind of, let's say, evidence base, what they can bring with the nature of those products, I think it's, it, I think it's the perfect kind of, um, I think, uh, product class to really enter into those discussions. But at the end of the day, I mean, we, what we have as well just shown in the early kind of uh, slides uh, this evening, um, we had as well the kind of non-outcome space risk share agreements, right? The, 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 the pure financial ones. I think also those ones um, are basically applied. And uh, um, I mean, all of those which are, were as well successful, especially also from an industry perspective, have been implemented also what Roman said just before the companies have entered into the AMNOC process. I think there are a couple of very, very good examples. So they agreed basically with a good number of health insurance before they even uh, launched the product into Germany. And uh, guess what? The price negotiations were quite smooth, even that the price at the end of the day was at least seen from the public for one of the other products as well uh, as quite high. So just keep that in mind, right? I think it's always a kind of, let's say, um, balance what you need to have as well in terms of uh, speedness, um, in terms of the whole process, even though that we all know 
within the AMLOG process, the, the product is uh, already available um, basically at the time of launch, right at the time of the AMLOG process. But I think it's also the kind of question which you would, would really get out of the price negotiation, especially maybe if the evidence base might not be that uh, strong. Wonderful. Um, so time for one last question. And uh, it's already coming. Um, I mean, we will in January 21, uh, the electronic patient file, that's like the airport of Berlin, right? Will come into <laughs> Germany, um, will take place here in our healthcare system. Um, I mean, we have a major delay like the airport in Berlin. So, um, but with this, uh, with your ideas here uh, showing tonight, how are there any, could be there any synergy effects or integration possibilities um, with the electro electronic patient files? Oh, okay, okay, we have to differentiate now between the electronic patient file and the um, electronic prescription because um, those those are um, separate pathways um, and we really have to distinguish this because the, yeah, the question is about the electronic patient file, but you can also later yeah. uh, asking about the electronic prescription, of course. Sure. And because the electronic patient file will be uh, totally um, uh, owned and um, the data ownership is uh, with the patients. So um, there, there are ideas. Um, I think it's phase three or something uh, because it's going to be a stepwise uh, approach um, implementation in the market and phase three or something. They're planning to have the possibility to do research with those data and there we're not um, enabling um, managed entry agreement. So this is more longer term idea of having those data implemented within the pricing framework. And I think that is not planned at the moment. What is um, now happening is the electronic prescription. Um, as you already mentioned, Lutz, it's uh, delayed as, as uh, unfortunately always in Germany. But anyways, um, this uh, really speeds up the process at the moment. Um, there were discussions putting indications on the prescription, but my last um, standpoint on that was, um, or my last um, input on that was that that is not happening. Um, that would have been uh, great for managed entry agreements, but we also have to um, put in, um, keep into mind that physicians play a major role in the health system. And if you put the indication on a prescription, that means that the pharmacist sees what the uh, what the um, physician is um, giving to that patient, and they could control it. And so there we're coming from. It's kind of a political decision to not do that uh, because they want don't want to be controlled all the time or um, also other issues um, around um, having an indication on the, on the electronic description. Um, but if that would happen in the future, that would be an enabler for indication-based pricing, of course. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Uh, yeah, I think there were like all questions tonight. Um, so uh, let me show you now the a last slide uh, showing our next webinar. Um, that is about the 2020 US presidential election. And that is actually with our uh, good friends from the Purple Squirrel Economics, um, PSE. And uh, we're discussing with them um, the outcome of uh, the 2020 US presidential election, uh, which actually happening on November 3rd. So um, yeah. And the ones who don't vote it yet, don't vote for Trump. Okay, that's just like my personal opinion, but I think we like all agree somehow here on that. Um, now, feel free to registering is open, I think, uh, uh, from tomorrow. And uh, it's always uh, the last uh, Thursday here at 9 p.m. in German time and 12 uh, p.m. Pacific time. That's it uh, for tonight. Uh, thank you again, uh, Roman and Stefan for this wonderful presentation on all the audience uh, for the nice questions. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for all that uh, messages here and uh, stay healthy. Um, just uh, try to not let the virus get you down and uh, goodbye and good night, good luck. Thank you much.
Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.